How much is one plus one? Most people answer two. One plus one doesn't equal two, as or more often as it does. Mindfulness, a powerful tool that helps us engage fully with the present moment. Mindfulness has nothing to do with practice. In fact, practice often makes people mindless. Meditation requires practice. People are often scared by uncertainty because they think they're supposed to know. Too many people are sealed in unlived lives and they think that that's the way they're supposed to be. Bored, stressed, lonely. A mistake is a wonderful thing because all of a sudden you become awake again. These mistakes are turned into incredible success. In each episode, we dwell into the realms of wellness, exploring the latest trends, expert advice, and practical tips to help lead you a happy, healthier life. We aim to bring a broader perspective to our American audience on issues that impact your daily life by interviewing guests from the US and around the world. From nutrition and fitness to mental well-being and beyond, we're here to empower you with knowledge and inspiration. So whether you're looking to boost your energy, revamp your diet, or simply trying to find a balance in your lifestyle, you're at the right place. Join us as we embark on a journey towards a better, brighter you. I'm your host, Dr. Amir Khan, and together let's unlock the secrets to living life to its fullest. Mindfulness, a powerful tool that helps us engage fully with the present moment. It allows us to reduce stress, improve focus, and enhance overall well-being. Instead of life pass by us, mindfulness helps us truly experience and sever it. It's one moment at a time. Welcome to Khan Clinics, powered by American Muslim Today. I'm your host, Dr. Amir Khan. Our guest today is a renowned American psychologist. She's a professor at the Harvard University. She's known best for her pioneering work on mindfulness and the psychology of possibility, often referred as the mother of mindfulness. Dr. Ellen Langer, her research focuses on how our mental states, particularly mindfulness and mindlessness, affects our health. It affects our well-being, and overall experience of life. Dr. Langer has written over 200 research articles and 13 books, including her recent edition, Mindful Body, Thinking Our Way to Chronic Health. Her research shows a new way to practice mindfulness, not through just meditation, but by simply noticing new things. She has earned three Distinguished Scientists Awards for Unifying Psychology, Guggenheim Fellowship, and the Liberty Science Genius Award. Dr. Langer, welcome to our show. Thank you, Amir. Let's get started, Dr. Langer. You are known to be the mother of mindfulness. It's a nice child to have. How did you first become interested in mindfulness and what inspires you to explore its effects? on everyday life? That's a bigger question than I think you think. I was living in New York and I walk into a store, I'd bang into a mannequin and I'd say, I'm sorry. And I started paying attention to the, the odd things that I did. And of course then noticed the odd things that other people did. Then I moved up to Cambridge uh, to mm -hmm. join the faculty at Harvard. This was 1977, so quite a while ago. And um, I expected everybody in Cambridge to be really smart. And while they may be, uh, their day-to-day -day behavior seemed bizarre to me. So for example, at that time, the bank closed at three in the afternoon. That meant that there would be 10 parking spaces available. In New York, by you know, 301, they'd be taken, not in Cambridge. You know, you'd go into a, uh, inside the bank and you'd have people online. In New York, everybody's looking for the shortest line. <laughs> there, right. nobody seems to care or even notice. Anyway, so I, you know, first were studying mindlessness and found and have found this throughout the 45 years of research 
that mindlessness is pervasive. And the fun thing is that when you're not there, you're not there to know you're not there. So you can't check and see if you, everybody thinks they're mindful and everybody else is mindless. Now, most of us are mindless, sadly, almost all of the time. I ran into somebody and I, I think he's probably happy. I don't remember who he was because okay. uh, in this conversation that wasn't particularly nice, he said to me, you know, you are what, you know, people study what they are. And so I was studying mindlessness. So I just turned it around and that's how I started to study mindfulness. What was interesting to me was that there was this massive uh, ancient tradition you know, uh, going back thousands of years. And what was wonderful was that the the scientific uh, studies that I was doing were yielding the same consequences as predicted by some of this ancient philosophy. And that was very exciting. When people hear the word mindfulness, they tend to think of meditation. And I did early work, very early work on transcendental meditation. Mindfulness that I study now and have been studying for the last 40 years uh, is not meditation. Meditation isn't mindfulness, by the way. Meditation is a practice you undergo, hopefully to lead to post-meditative mindfulness. Mindfulness as we study it is not a practice and it's more immediate. You don't, you know, when you, for meditation, you take yourself out of the world, you sit still for 20 minutes, twice a day, repeat a mantra, very different from mindfulness as we study it here. You're actively noticing. You can become mindful in two different ways. One we'll say is top down. I'll explain in a moment. The other bottom up. So top down, once you recognize, which is hard for people, that uncertainty is the rule, not the exception. Everything is always changing. Everything looks different from different perspectives. So you can't know. But all of us are taught by our parents in schools that we do know. You know so what I often, uh, to make this clear on there, let me ask you, how much is one plus one? Because this is the thing everybody thinks they know for sure. So how much is one plus one? It could be 11. Okay, it be, well. <laughs> it could be two. It yes. could be two. Okay. It depends right. Right. how it depends. you put it together, right? <laughs> exactly. But for most people, they mindlessly answer two and they think, oh God, they roll their eyes. So they have to listen to this because they think it's going to be silly. But it turns out that in the real world, one plus one doesn't equal two, as or more often as it does. If you add one watt of chewing gum to one watt of chewing gum, one plus one is one. You add one cloud to one cloud, one plus one is one. You add one pile of laundry to one pile of one. Okay. So somebody wrote to me the other day and told me, you know, if you take one pizza and you add one pizza, you have two pizzas. But... If you take one lasagna and you add to it one lasagna, one plus one is one. It's just a, a bigger lasagna. Okay, All right. Absolutely. Now, many people don't know there are different number systems. So one plus one equaling two is on the base 10 number system. If you use a base two number system, one plus one is written as 10. So, oh my goodness. So now one plus one can be one, two, 10. And as you started, 11. Okay, now what is the point? The point is, once you recognize that the information we have are maybes, not absolutes, and you look a little closer, and you now have four different choices. When you're mindful, you have choices. When you're mindless, you don't have any choice. All right, so um, so that's top down, recognizing that Can I say everything that, is- you put, that, you put that very well. It makes total sense. You, you're saying for a second, you have to perceive you have to process and then you go about saying what you want to say. So, yeah, all those things you memorized in school are not necessarily so. So let me give you the, the most shocking example for me um, was many, many years ago, I was at a horse event. You have to remember, and your, your audience probably knows this by all those awards you mentioned. So I'm a straight A student, right? I know everything. I'm at this horse event. And this man asked me, can I watch his horse for him? Because he's going to get his horse a hot dog. Hot dog. <laughs> Horses don't eat meat, right? I memorized that. I knew that. I got that right on a test somewhere. But I said, of course, I'll watch your horse for you. He comes back with the, the hot dog and the horse ate it. And that's when I realized that everything I thought I knew could be wrong. And what we don't realize is almost all of our facts are are deduced or given to us from science. And scientific studies 
only give us probabilities. So the studies that were run were with some horses, not all kinds of horses, that weighed a certain amount. They could have been very large, very small, given meat mixed with how much grain and so on and so forth. And I'm sure, and if they actually did the study, not all of the horses, uh, that some of the horses ate the hot dog, but it becomes significant if, you know, 80% of them don't eat. So that probability, that maybe, is translated as absolute. And so it is with every fact we know. Well, you know, that was startling to me and made me realize that I may know nothing. Now, a normal person might be worried about that. I found it very exciting because that meant that all of the things that I've been taught can't be, might possibly be able to be. It opened up a world of possibility. And we'll talk about some of those possibilities, but let me go back to the two ways of becoming mindful. We say, so top down, you know you don't know, you naturally pay attention. You don't have to practice anything. If you were going to come visit me, right now I'm at our house in Dartmouth, Mass. You've never been here. You don't have to practice. You walk in, you're going to, what, did she do that painting? What is she, what is that? You're just going to be alive with uh, noticing all sorts of things, no practice. And what happens when you're noticing, it's literally and figuratively enlivening. And the act of noticing is the, the way we become engaged with anything. So top down, you know, you don't know, you pay attention. Bottom up, if anybody, if you're, you know, listening to me and there's somebody next to you, notice three new things about them. Walk outside, notice three new things. If you take the things you think you know and you look at them anew, that they're going to be new to you. They're going to have things that you didn't realize were even there. All right. And you do that often enough, you end up in the same place of being uncertain. So we have to learn how to exploit the power in uncertainty, not run from it. But uncertainty is scary to people, but it's scary for the wrong reason. Um, people are often scared by uncertainty because they think they're supposed to know. Right. Professor Langer, Dr. Kahn, they, they probably know I'll fake it. You know, but if Dr. Kahn and Professor Langer act as if they know, then they're faking it because nobody can know for sure. Since again, everything is changing. All right, so what that means, the bottom line is, instead of making a personal attribution for not knowing, I don't know, but you may know, it's knowable, so I'll try to hide my ignorance, we make a universal attribution, nobody knows, right? And then you accept not knowing, and I think the most successful way to be in this world is to be confident and uncertain. People typically conflate confidence and certainty. They think, you know, when you know, then you can be confident. But the person who's pretending to know is confusing. This might be a little a mouthful, but confusing the stability of their mindsets with the stability of the underlying phenomenon. Everything is changing. You want to hold it still and think you know it, you know, that's fine, but it's it's not what's going on. All right, so the this act, so let me define now these two terms. So when you're mindful, you're noticing new things. As you're noticing new things, that puts you in the present necessarily, mm -hmm. makes you sensitive to context and perspective. You could have rules and routines, but they're not determining what you're doing. They're just guiding you, you know, so that you can, you're still driving the car in some sense, driving where you're going, what you're doing, and can make changes. Um, it's the essence of engagement. So when you're mindful and you're engaged, that's when you're happy. And I realized something because I'm going to be giving a lecture soon to uh, the World Happiness Fest. So I was thinking happiness in particular. If I ask people, can a robot be happy? And nobody's going to say, yes, robots are unhappy. Well, when we're mindless, we're acting like robots. So when you're mindless, you're behaving. Everything you're doing is based on what made sense in the past. So you're not in the present. You're not sensitive to context or perspective. Rules and routines govern what you're doing rather gotcha. than guide what you're doing. And this being mindful, this act of noticing, the neurons are firing and 45 years of research has made me confident that um, it's literally and figuratively enlivening. The more of this you do, the happier you're going to be because you can't be happy unless you're noticing and engaged in the world. And all of that 
um, is good for your health. There's no cost to all of this. So let me summarize a little bit here. A um, couple of things. You don't want us to be uncertain. You don't want us to be mind less you want us to be uncertain or probably you're saying we are uncertain about everything so we can't change that because well, no, so not problems. always but i mean so that when uh, he asked me to watch his horse right. i thought he was crazy right i knew i was wrong in fact a way of understanding mindlessness is you're frequently in error but rarely in doubt so I, I had no doubt that the horse wasn't going to eat it. And wow, I was wrong. So we're not aware of this. We're not aware of our own errors, so to speak. You know, like one and one is two. Horses don't eat meat. Yeah, go on. I'm sorry. So do you think that's because we're, we're spoon fed? We're ingrained to think in a particular way. We grow up that way. And so we're going to think like that. And we're, on certain things, we're very certain mm -hmm. and we leave nothing to doubt. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we're very uncertain and we're less confident. And yeah. you're saying what we are saying here is that from top down, we don't know. We're uncertain. It's okay to be uncertain. Not okay. It's crucial Not for your crucial. well being and happiness. Okay. Gotcha. Because so certainty, it's... when you're certain, you're mindless. When you're mindless, you're no different from a robot. Ah, and okay. the system is slowly turning itself off. So you're saying, let's not be certain. Yes, let's exactly. Not be, leave some doubt. Even yes, when so you're very certain. That the, things, that the things we're certain of, most of them came from scientific probabilities. You know, I, I was at a friend's house many years ago, and she made me dinner. And this was very sweet of her, right? Um, but I saw that the fork was on the right side of the plate. Okay. I felt like some natural law had, was violated because the fork goes on the left side of the plate, right? And right. it was all I could do, but to move the fork, because I didn't want to be rude. Then I started to think about this. I said, what is it? Why should the fork be on one side of the, why does it matter to because me? Because they want you to eat with your left hand. And no, 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 because most people reach over to the other side right. to get the fork. No, I mean, there's no real sense to it, but the point here was that I looked back to see where did I learn this? It wasn't deduced from science. It wasn't a function of deep reasoning about what is the best placement for the uh, flatware. My mother said when I was a little kid, the fork goes over here. That was right. it. And okay. so then forever I'm trapped. So you see how easy it is to become mindless. If somebody tells you something and you simply accept it without realizing that, well, it's true sometimes, not other times, and then you take it as real, this is where the horse goes, one and one is two, horses don't eat meat, and your life is, is being dictated, and the older you get, you know, in schools, for instance, because schools are, I think, the major, oddly, the major culprits in teaching us to be mindless, you know, look on it. So can I, can I say that then in that case, Dr. Langer? Would it be appropriate then to say that what benefit does it bring that we become over mindful? No, you don't want to become over, but okay. So the best way to be is never to assume, you know, so people say people, sometimes people think, well, if it's mindless and what you're suggesting here, it's unimportant. Isn't it better just not to think about it? So, so okay. So now let's say you have a three-year-old, you take the three-year-old to the park. And the three-year-old walks into traffic. Oh, my God. People think, shouldn't you just grab the kid and to, you know, to safety and do that mindlessly? I say, no. First of all, if you were mindful, the child wouldn't have ended up in the street in the first place. Second, there's a lot of information to be garnered in seconds by noticing that car to see if you, because should you pull the child to the right or to the left? You know, it depends on which way you think the car is going and sure. so on. I think there are only... When two conditions and only two conditions are met, is it to your advantage to be mindless? Excuse me. One, if you found the very best way of doing something. And okay. two, nothing changes. Well, neither of those are going to be met. You know, what happens now is that people, oh, let's say at 25, learn things. Um, it can be how to do a sport, how to drive a car, how to do anything. It, with the sense of a 25 year old. Now, if they lock themselves in, then they're going to be behaving that same way, essentially, when they're 45, 60. You know, some of the, the debilitation or the 
the lessened performance that happens as you get older is because you're still using the rules you used when you were younger rather than changing as your body changes, taking advantage of the changes. You know, uh, just a simple thing. So let's say you're taught this is the way you hold a tennis racket and where you serve the ball. Okay. And last night before a game, you didn't sleep very well. And so your shoulder hurts a slight bit. You should not swing the racket the same way as when your shoulder was strong. But mindlessly, you're going to do everything just as you did it before. Even more important, I, I uh, show this in class a lot. When I'm lecturing, I'll look in the audience and see, is there somebody, anybody out there that is five? I invite them to the stage. I'm five, three. First, we look silly next to each other. Next thing I ask, can you put your hand up? His hand is three inches larger than mine. And then I just raise the question, should we do anything physical the same way? Now, the bottom line to all of that reasoning is the more different you are from the person who wrote the rule, wrote the instructions, the more important it is for you not to mindlessly follow them, but rather to find your own way. And we don't do that. When someone says, this is the way you do it, how, how sensible is that when we're all so different physically? The same thing emotionally and you know, everything else that we're learning. Okay. So thank you for clarifying that. I guess it makes sense. Your thing, find your own way. Well, you, you yeah. the important part of that is that people don't think to find their own way because they've been shown what they take as the way. And there is no the way, you know, so let's his say- way. Let's say, Dr. Langer, there is an advantage. There Mindfulness, is. we say your work revolves around that, improves health. Tell us some recent findings. Okay, so that, that was easy. Easy. Yeah, this is most exciting for me. First, uh-huh. years ago, we did several studies where we take elderly people, we teach them to be mindful. And this is just active noticing, and they live longer. So the consequences are enormous. It occurred to me after that horse event to question everything. One of the things that I question was mind-body dualism. Hmm. People talk about this, you know, your mind, your body, without really knowing what they're talking about. And these are really just words. And I say, you know, if you have a mind and a body, then you have to figure out how do you get from this fuzzy thing called a thought to something material called a body? How do they talk to each other? I say, this is all silly. Let's take the mind and the body put them back together. If we see it as one thing, then wherever we put the mind, we're necessarily putting the body. Now, these studies all reported in a very fun way in the mindful body. The first one of these was the counterclockwise study. What we did was retrofit a retreat to appear to be 20 years earlier. We had elderly men live there as if they were their younger selves. So they talked about past events as if they were just unfolding. Everything that was happening was as if it was happening 20 years ago. So to you, you're 20 years younger. In a week, the measurements showed old men. Their vision improved, their hearing improved, their memory improved, their strength improved, and they looked noticeably younger. That was the first of all of these. And I have many of these. The next one is even more startling. You should feel what you, if you feel like you're young, you're going to be young. If you Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that people think because of some of these absolutes, uh, they assume they can't do many things. Um, you know, you don't do it a few times and then you say, I'll never be able to do it again, or I can only achieve this much success and so on. And you can never know that. But those are the things, the kinds of expectations that block us and and hurt us in ways that people don't even realize. Before I tell you the chambermaid study to support what I'm saying now, I say in my health class, how far is it humanly possible to run? So these are Harvard kids. They're very smart. They know a marathon is 26 miles. They know I wouldn't ask the question if the answer was 26 miles. They start guessing 30, 35, and when somebody finally says 50 miles, everybody groans like, oh, you know, how could that be? Then I turn on a YouTube of the Tariamora, which is a tribe in Copper Canyon, Mexico. These people, as a rule, are able to run over 200 miles without stop. That's a massive difference, right? Now, the, so, we, so we have an average person 
among the Tariamora compared to our Olympic athletes here. And that only approximates the difference between, in my view, of what we think we can do and what in fact we can accomplish by changing all of our mindsets. So we go to these chambermaids. You know, chambermaids are the women who are cleaning hotel and motel. First thing we do is ask them, how much exercise are you getting? Mm -hmm. Even though they're exercising all day long, yeah. because the Surgeon General says exercise is what you do after work, because he or she sits at a desk all day, they right. don't see, and you know, they're tired. They don't get any exercise in their minds. We right. divide them into two groups. I did this research with Ali Crum. We do um, divide them into two groups and we teach one group that their work is exercise. Making a bed is like working at the machine at the gym and so on. So now you have two groups. One group doesn't realize their work is exercise. The other group now realizes it. Okay. So they're mindful. They're, 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 they're yes. mindful. Yes, they're mindful. But and, um, yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, now what happens and this goes on for a week or two. I don't remember how long we ran it. Um, we we're ready to see, does it make any difference that they now have changed their mindset and see their work as exercise? The two groups are not eating any differently. Mm -hmm. They're not working harder or less hard than the other group. Nevertheless, the group that now sees their work as exercise lost weight. There was a change in waist to hip ratio, body That's mass index. And their blood well, came out. I've got to say that that's fascinating. Okay, I'll give you one more and then we'll go because sure. there's so much in this book that, you know, yeah. is exciting in, in these ways. All we, in mindful body, right? Thinking your body. way to chronic, chronic health. health. Okay. It's, it's the you've, used a, you've inter used an interesting term, chronic health. Yeah, so, I mean, just to make people pay attention to why they should accept chronic should only be illness. Thank you for exactly, that. exactly. Well, you made us mindful at the type on the title, the title then, right? Was my intention. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we okay. inflict a wound. This is Peter on right. my graduate suit, and I inflict a wound, minor uh -huh. wound, but a wound. Uh -huh. And we have people individually sitting in front of a clock. Unbeknownst to them, the clock is rigged. For a third of the people, the clock is going twice as fast as real time. Okay. For a third of the people. The clock is going half as fast as real time. For a third of the people, the clock is real time. The question we're asking is, does that clock perceive time have any effect on healing? Well, the answer is yes. Really? Wound heals based on perceived time. No clock, way. Not no, real time. Really. So we have lots of these. And these, let me tell you that you'll enjoy this story. <laughs> So when I started to write The Mindful Body, I wrote it as a memoir. So there are lots of very personal stories in them. And um, I, these seeds were sown many, many years ago for this mind-body unity. People talk mind-body connection. It's wrong. Mm -hmm. How are they connected? It's one thing. Okay, let me tell you the story. So I was married when I was obscenely young. Don't tell anybody. Well, I was secretly married first, and that they can read about. Then I got married again at eight, uh, 19. And okay. my then husband and I went to Paris on our honeymoon. So we're in a restaurant, and I order a mixed grill. On the mixed mm -hmm. grill is pancreas. It is a pancreas. And I felt, because now I was all grown up because I was married, I was a married woman, it meant I had to eat the pancreas. I still don't understand why I would think that, but that's what I felt. Uh -huh. So I say to, to him, who he had been, you know, he was more worldly than I at the time, which of these things is the pancreas? Is that? So, okay, I eat everything else very carefully. Now the moment of truth. Can I get myself to eat it? I start right. eating it. And I literally get sick. Meantime, he starts laughing. I've heard that story I, before. Something why similar. are you laughing? He said, because that's chicken. I had eaten the pancreas. Yeah. So yes, I made myself sick. Let me give the other pa half of that because my mother had breast cancer. The cancer had metastasized to her pancreas, which is the end game. So the medical world was treating her as if she was going to, die, you know, had weeks left, maybe um, a couple of months left to live. And then magically, it was totally gone. So somehow she made herself well, I made myself sick, and then I spent the next 45 years trying to figure out what's going on. Wow. Brilliant. Fascinating stories. And I'm sure, sure, your audience, our audience can read more about this in your book. 
I have a question off the record sort of thing. Can we say if we think what we can do, can in reality a Jedi lift an aeroplane? Can it go to that extent? Because we're now mind. You know, can we possess power? When people ask the question, can something be done? They look to see if it's ever been done before. And then if it hasn't, they conclude it can't be done. Okay. And all we know is that tomorrow they'll be doing things that we can't do today. You know, so uh, I think that if for some reason, you know, Amir, I give you my blessing. If you want to lift an airplane, you should try to lift an airplane. And that if it's fun for you, if you're doing it mindfully, you're growing while you're doing it. And enjoying enjoying it, you know. But and, would the you know, mind have external powers to have that even capability to do that? I know it's a silly question, oh, but no, now I that know. because if you mention healing gets better, that's because it's your part of your body. Mm -hmm. Time slows down, or it can be fast. Mm -hmm. You mention if we perceive eat, we could make the wrong conclusions, but at times we make the right conclusions as well. Yeah. Is there any power around the mind that can do that? A classic example, probably another one would be stress. If we don't see stress as it is, mm -hmm. and we see it as a challenge, for example. Well, yeah, you can do that. Or there's another way. I'm glad you brought up stress because I spent a lot of time uh, talking about it in all my books, but most particularly in the mindful body. Okay. Stress doesn't occur because of events. Events aren't stressful, they're not unstressful, they're nothing, they're just events. We interpret them. You know, so if you take this event and you say to yourself, oh my God, and add whatever, um, of course it's going to be stressful. And we have a culture, the world's culture now, who believes that that's life. Life just happens to be stressful. I, I don't believe that. You know, that if the more mindful we are, the less stress we'll have because the more potential understandings of events there will be. One liner for your audience that you know, some of these things need to sink in, and but, you know, this I'll appreciate right away, which is ask yourself the next time you're stressed, is it a tragedy or an inconvenience? And almost okay. never is it a tragedy. And, you know, right. but we're making it a tragedy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in some sense, it should be no worry before it's time. The worrying doesn't make that if you're right, that this impending thing is going to be awful. Worrying about it is only weakening you, making it harder to deal with it should occur. What people don't understand is that evaluations, all evaluations are in our heads. We're taught they're not part and parcel. You know, anything that's good is also bad. Anything bad is also good. Obviously, if you're looking for bad, you're going to see bad and then you're going to suffer. And um, all of that, emotions, let me say it a little differently. People don't realize that emotions are choices. Our emotions follow our understanding of an event. You change the understanding. You know, I know that when I talk like this, people, what do you know? You from your ivory tower. And I tell a story in the book. And this is, well, I was at a friend's house for dinner. I come home. It's about 1130 at night. All my neighbors are outside to greet me because my house just burned down, destroying 80% of what I owned. I stay at a friend's house that night. The next day, I call the insurance company. He comes over and he said, in his 25 years at the job, this was the first time that the damage was worse than the call. <laughs> Every, oh my God, oh my God. And he gets there and it's not so terrible. But to me, I already lost everything. You know, I, why throw my mental health away with it? Okay, so I move into the Charles Hotel with my dogs, and it's Christmas. The most important thing about this story, I'm going to tell you, Amir, is that mm -hmm. it took me years of telling it where I finally have been able to tell it without crying happy tears, as I'm saying, because this was the most touching thing that ever happened. So it's Christmas Eve. I go out. Um, I come back to the room. The room is full of gifts, not from the management of the hotel, really, not from really. the owner, from the chambermaids, the waiters and waitresses, uh, oh. the people who parked my car. It was beautiful, you know, and every single Christmas, um, I remember it and it restores my faith in people. 
which these days is something we really need. And I don't remember, except for one thing, you know, what I lost in that fire. So, well, it, you know, no one would say having the fire was a good thing. If we looked over time, yeah, it brought me more pleasure than pain for sure. But that's not the world most of us experience. Most of us experience, oh my God, I missed the appointment. Oh my God, I screwed up the project. Oh my God, I was rejected. You know, things that are not, oh my, you know, my goodness, you know, that uh, there are alternative, alternative views. Um, one of my favorites is, you know, the story about the company that was producing a glue. And so they put millions of dollars in making this glue. And then the glue failed to adhere. Oh my gosh, what a failure. You can imagine how stressed the CEO was. But somehow, and I know how, we can talk about it if you want, they shifted gears and they took that very substance and instead of a glue, they made a post-it note. Okay. So that mistake led them to the post-it note where I think they've made far more money. This is 3M than they would have with that glue. And so when you make a mistake, a mistake is a wonderful thing because all of a sudden you become awake again. And if you then go forward rather than try to go back, you end up, it's not the infrequent story or it's not the most common, but where these mistakes are turned into um, incredible successes. When you're mindless, you're blind to opportunity. It's just that simple. You see what you expect to see. And, you know, and there's so much more to be seen. And we've all had that experience. I mean, everybody has, you know, the experience of where are my keys or where is that pen that I was looking for? And then you find that it was right in front of you, but you didn't see it. It was. You're absolutely right. I love the phrase where you said that if it's stress, a lot of times you want to think, is it a tragedy or really an inconvenience? And you said 90% of the time is probably or likely and, is inconvenience. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that you alluded to, you know, mistakes are good to do. Uh, laugh at them. I had, I had well, one friend the reason who always do one that. The reason mistakes are good is because you can be successful mindlessly, you know, by chance in some sense. So you right. get the you guess the right answer and you never know that there was more to whatever the thing was. When you make the mistake, you have to review it. And with mistakes, though, here's something interesting also, I think, that when we're doing something, whatever we're doing, was a decision that we made. Right. Now, for something to be a decision means there has to be uncertainty. There was no uncertainty. There's nothing to decide, right? So should I do this or should I do that? Then you make the decision and then people mindlessly act as if that's the only way it could be, mm -hmm. you know, so that when they make a mistake, what they want to do is just go back and make it just as it was supposed to be, but it was not supposed to be. That was just one of several ways it could be. I know that there's a lot here and I don't know how much of it can easily be digested hearing it, but I think that people don't recognize that if I'm saying, which I, I am, that virtually everything that is was a decision, that means everything that is could have been otherwise. That means that everything is malleable. That means if something's not working for you, change it. And now people, if you said to somebody, let me give you an example. So even in my first lecture, I walk into this big uh, lecture I was giving. I walk into this room and the chairs are very far from the stage. And I knew that was going to make me nervous. So I moved all the chairs now for my own comfort. Now, if you say to anybody, could you move the chairs? Everybody's going to say yes, right? They know chairs move, but it's not going to occur to them. And right. that's the difference between okay. mindful and mindless. When it's mindless, it doesn't occur to you that it could. It's like that old commercial. Do you remember? Oh, I should have had a V8. You know, right. uh, yes. where if every day you drink orange juice, and right. orange juice is great, but on some days it might be tastier for you or, or healthier or whatever to drink a cranberry juice or tomato juice or something, but it just doesn't occur to us. I when you. we're mindless, so many possible benefits are just not occurring to us to consider. Thank you for explaining that. The audience asking, ask Dr. Langer to give us some practical tips about how do we practice mindfulness? One, for beginners, and second, for those who are very busy in their lives and have got little time, how do we practice okay. 
Okay. The, the first way, Amir, is to recognize you don't need to practice. Meditation requires practice. Mindfulness, as we're talking about, it has nothing to do with practice. In fact, practice often makes people mindless. Oh, what you want to do is recognize the power of uncertainty. And then... You know, everything feels new and exciting. And that, you know, you do something and you screw up, you could feel bad or you could laugh at it. You know, your reaction isn't uh, predetermined. Um, you can see it as, oh my gosh, this is who I am, or this is what I did. You know, then do something different. You know, our, everything we're doing is trying to hold things still when things naturally want to fluctuate. I would just say, Dr. Lang, don't be too rigid. And yeah. Don't, you know, be, yeah, that, don't be um, too rigid. It's all right to make mistakes. It's all right to learn. Yeah. It's all right to enjoy. It's all right to laugh at your mistake and look at the well, opportunities. That's but here's something that people brilliant. don't realize. You can be perfectly mindless or imperfectly mindful. So an example I've, I've used often, remember you're a little kid and you get in the elevator and you try to press the button, you know, but you're too short. You can't. Your parents pick you up and you press it. And the next time you get in there, you get in a little closer. You know, so it's great fun for the child, right? Then finally, the child is tall enough, presses the button. You tell me the last time you pressed a button in an elevator where it was exciting for you. So the point is, we don't want all that perfection that we keep seeking. It's the you know the journey to that perfection that's fun. But once we achieve it, then it becomes mindless. And when it's mindless, we're not there to enjoy it. So just enjoy, just pause and be mindful. Yeah. Recognize. And, and so the tip recognize. Is, yeah. The, the tip to how to be mindful, we'll go back to the first thing we said, was one, appreciate that everything is uncertain, not just for you. So it's not that you're stupid, that you don't know. Nobody really knows because everything is always changing. Two is of the things you think you know, notice new things about them. And then you'll see you didn't know as well as you thought you did. And you do that often enough and you come again to appreciate the glory in some sense of uncertainty. It's the uncertainty that keeps you excited. Right? It's very easy. And it's not only that it's easy, but it's this act of noticing is energy beginning. So it's good for you, keeps you happy, keeps you healthy, living longer. Uh, it even reveals itself in the things that we do, leaves its imprint on the products we create. I, there's no downside. Love it. Very good. Last question. You wrote your book, Mindful Body, Thinking Your Way to Chronic Health, and you do have an artistic background. Tell us how did you combine the two? And well, no, no, it's very interesting. So I was brought up when, you know, some teacher... I can't imagine what mark I might have made on a page that would lead the teacher to believe I had no talent. But I, I wasn't one of those kids who could draw. Um, as I tell the story in The Mindful Body, at one point in college, I was doing some work for a professor and I came up with something that she didn't know. And that made it a big thing because I had suggested something new to her. So she said how creative I was. Then I had another teacher around the same time. I uh, wrote a program text as a final paper and he wrote on the paper, I can't believe your chutzpah, <laughs> you know, which is, and so in some way, two professors were simultaneously telling me I was creative. It was never a label I had for myself. So then I started to explore and let me, let me see what it means to be creative. Now, nothing much happened. I you know, did my psychology and uh, came up with creative experiments. And then when I was about 50, I started painting. And um, I would paint and I'd have some experience. And then I'd go back as a psychologist and do studies to see, was it just true for me or was it more generally true? And that all, I wrote about all of that in the On Becoming an Artist book. But it's it's great fun, you know, and there are some people who love my things, some people, ugh, you know, think they're terrible. And you know, and that's fine too. It's if you paint by numbers, then it's not going to do anything good for you. If you just copy the masters, it's not going to do much, as much for you. But if you do it mindfully, it's a way to come to realize what that feeling feels like. You, you don't have to paint. You can start writing poetry, take photographs, learn the kazoo. I mean, it doesn't matter. When you start something new, the excitement you have about it is the way I think we should feel all the time. Let that be the baseline 
And when you deviate from that, then make the change. Right now, sadly, too many people are settled in unlived lives, and they think that that's the way they're supposed to be. Bored, stressed, lonely, and I say, it doesn't have to be that way. And happily, to make the change doesn't cost anything and um, is reasonably simple. Dr. Langer, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on mindfulness and good luck. And if anyone wants any more information, please look at the book, Mindful Body, Thinking Our Way to Chronic Health. To the viewers. Thank you, this was fun. Absolutely. Well, appreciate it. Thank you. And to our amazing audience, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Khan Clinics. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with your friends, give us a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button. Drop your comments. We love to hear your thoughts. Thank you for everyone being with us. Thank you for the opportunity. And I want to thank my team who brought this presentation. This presentation was brought by Khan Clinics, powered by American Muslim Today. Please don't forget to subscribe, share, and comment in Khan Clinics. Thank you.